Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Whiskey Neat, Spirited Conversations with Interesting People. I'm your host, Christopher Hart. Man, man. boy, this week was something else. Uh, First in-studio guest in a couple of months, it feels like, uh, Mark Schilling from Big Thirst Marketing, the CEO of Susto Mezcal. Uh, we We do a lot of shit talking this episode, right? Uh, uh, we talk about God so much, but to be clear, uh, we're two people having a conversation about this industry, we're friends, these conversations we would have without the camera, uh, I, I, we, a lot of it was, was not actually shit talking, it was more of just, you know, kind of revealing how I feel about some things. Um, but yeah, so, so, so Mark is a, a longtime friend. He's the CEO of Susto Mezcal. Uh, we, we talk Mezcal. We talk the abomination that is the agave industry in uh, America and how I feel um, some people take advantage of Mexican producers and that it's the one thing that's not talked about enough, which we have covered on the show before. Uh, of course, I, I, I put Gregarious Grump in front of Mark, which, by the way, guys, Gregarious Grump is now available online through Sealbox, S-E-E-L-B-A-C-H-S, Sealbox.com. Google Gregarious Grump Sealbox. Uh, we've got our cognacs up there, the 10-year, the 12-year, the 14-year, and the 30-year, which I think they just sold out of. And, of course, Prideful Goat, all available on Sealbox. Um, we will, we've got more coming, more things to come. The seventh annual Houston Whiskey Social tickets just went on sale last night at midnight. Last night at midnight. We are, what I can only assume, millions and millions of dollars into ticket sales in the last six hours. And uh, you can get your tickets at HoustonWhiskeySocial.com. Go to Eventbrite. Look up The Whiskey Social. Google the seventh annual Whiskey Social. Uh, Go to Facebook. We've got The Houston Whiskey Social seventh annual event online. Get your tickets. The Pappy and BTAC tickets are definitely gone, but we've got uh, tens of thousands of dollars of vintage whiskey that we're going to be featuring. We're going to be expecting somewhere between 1,800 and 2,000 guests. Uh, we have we have all the plans in the world for, for our seventh annual event. I, I could not be more excited. HoustonWhiskeySocial.com, whiskey with the E. Get your tickets today. Consider this us paying the bills. I'm not doing an ad read today, but we start off with Waterford. Uh, the, if there's anyone I know in this industry for almost a decade that is nerdy about terroir, about origin, about the development, about production, about marketing, every aspect of, of what it takes to produce a spirit, it's Mark Schilling over at Berg, Big Thirst Marketing and Big Thirst Consulting. Uh, Mark has been a good friend of mine. He's uh, a legal expert in the, the stupid laws in this stupid state and uh, has consulted acro- with distillers across the state in, in developing products. It's the reason he's just become CEO of, of Susto, Susto Mezcal. Uh, he's, he's just a good friend of mine. So w- we catch up. We talk about everything's working on. We talk about everything I'm working on, me leaving Gulf Coast Distillers, uh, the development of Giant Texas Distillers, it's just an episode for me to catch up with a good friend and what he's doing. So, um, without further ado, please welcome my good friend from Big Thirst Consulting, Big Thirst Marketing, um, uh, Susto Mescal, uh, Mark Schilling, uh, the man with with better hair than I could ever hope to have, especially at his age. Jesus Christ, he's got a good head of hair. Um, Mark Schilling, cheers. This is the uh, Luna 1.1. Do you know much about that brand? I don't. I know a little bit about the terroir um, yeah. study and whatnot, which I'm really into. I'm, I'm, yes. one of the, I'm one of the people that believes there is terroir. I, I have uh, evolved my opinion over time. Uh, essentially, I think that the higher the distillation proof, the lower the influence of terroir. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, the, well, of course it does. I said it, and I'm always correct. <laughs> uh, but I had the discussion with Mike from Reserve 101. He says it's bullshit, that the six regions of Scotland is bullshit. And it largely is, because a lot of them order barley from all over. The subject of terroir doesn't really play right. into their processes. Scotch is also distilled at super high proofs. Um, and what they have is signature aspects regional signature aspects mm-hmm. in the same way that enchiladas or tacos from here are going to taste right. different than from you know san antonio mm-hmm. 
So then I had Mike in, and Mike Mike brings me these great examples of mezcal and sotol, mm-hmm. where they're the only difference is the variety of plant in, in two examples. So the the, uh, the equipment's the exact same equipment. The mescalero or sotolero was the exact same cooker. Mm-hmm. The the parameters of the cooking process were the exact same. The only difference was the variety mm-hmm. or where the plant grew. Right. So he actually showed me examples. What, do you have something you want to say? No, no, no. no. I was just going to adjust this. Yeah. Keep, oh. keep going. Yeah, so, so he actually showed me examples of same distillation proof, same mm-hmm same cooker same chef uh and then uh i was like yeah i could tell the difference like it's it's clearly a thing and distillation proof on those items are very low so you're going to get all the plant influence and no wood influence which would also fuck up the idea of terroir if you have oak oak's going to overpower the distillate that doesn't mean it's not there it just means you and i and you know maybe even somebody with a one one of those super palettes Maybe you're not going to be able to detect it. It doesn't mean it's not there. Sure. But agave and sotol are really, really great examples of this because if you think about it, those plants have been sitting in the same place and growing in some cases for decades, right? Whereas with whiskey, corn, wheat, rye, malt, whatever it is. um, It's a season. Season. One season worth of terroir worth of existence, worth of experience, right? Whereas an agave might sit in the same place and experience weather and other conditions, other plants growing nearby it, sure. off and on for 8, 10, 12, <coughs> 25 years. So there's a lot more time for a lot of interesting things to happen. And that same plant that is growing up at the top of the hill versus the bottom of the hill, same as the experience of a barrel in a rickhouse, right? They're going to sure. have different experiences. Yeah. So, so we we definitely, I definitely am on the the path uh, of the understanding that the difference uh, of terroir is a real thing. Waterford has been pushing mm-hmm. for that. So, they actually put who who grew it like on the back mm-hmm. of the bottle. It actually says the growers were Trevor Harris, John McDonald. And Alan Mooney, it tells you the farm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it tells you the grain. I mean, it tells you every so much information that they can't fit on the bottle or the box that they actually put in a terroir code that you can mm-hmm. go online and look it up. Kind of like how um, uh, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society puts the codes, mm-hmm. and you can kind of s- see what distillery it came from. Yeah. It's a really interesting uh, aspect. I- I'd love to see, and they're doing a lot of different things. I know they're doing some some uh, uh, like wine finishes. Uh, I'd love to see. Uh, a cast strength option mm-hmm. just the whiskey high proof nerd in me I want to I want to taste more so um, I normally start with this it's a hundred proofer right right after I have my sugar free monster mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and then yeah I, I actually brought a few things I know that you've I, I can't, I, there's so much I want to talk about first of all welcome to the show welcome back thank you it's been a couple years Mark and I are good friends uh, Mark Schilling of Big Thirst Marketing of Big Thirst Consulting uh, and now your new title at Susto Mescal is Chief Executive Officer, which is really a um, it's a fancy way of saying in a very small company, um, you know, the guy that's responsible for everything that that gets fucked up mm-hmm. along the way. Yeah, yeah so you, it, it's all on you. You're it you're is. to blame. Yeah. Um, how long have you? Uh, I know it's about a month. Two. Well, s- sometime in February is okay. when it became official, and so. Susto was a client of Big Thirst Consulting uh, for a little while, and throughout that period of time, uh, kind of that relationship grew. The company is relatively new, very small. Um, Other than me, technically speaking, I guess you would say two employees. Uh, I would not count Crispin, our mescalero. He's actually a partner in the company, so I don't consider him an employee. Sure. Um, But... um, yeah, so it's it's really a matter of a comp- a small company growing to the degree that the founders of the company, who all have day jobs and, and other things, really needed somebody to be able to come in and run the day to day operations. Yeah, so I, I've we have a rule. Uh, a couple years ago, we kind of shifted. We don't do brand interviews anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, any any person who would. Uh, do a podcast or a show um, has done a bunch of them and it's usually the same spiel Mm -hmm. however 
The exception to this rule is we're friends. I've known you a long time. <laughs> uh, and there's so much more I want to talk to you beyond the brand. And I am obsessed with Mescal and Satol. Um, it's one of my dreams. I, it's a it's a weird climate for this sort of thing. But I've always wanted to do like a small batch for Gregarious. Yeah. Um, but to do it in a way that features the producer and and I'm more of a footnote. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's in the similar packaging. The, right. the logo's there. Like you know, it's my product. But it's not about me, and I'm not going to bastardize mm -hmm. it with anything. You know. Even then, I think we're still a little ways away from it. We we released a cognac. We released five cognacs this year, and the uh, there were a few people in the brandy world who were very nervous about the bourbon guy doing, what are you going to do to our brandy? Like, well, I'm not going to do anything to it. We're not going to do any <laughs> bourbon finishing. We're not going to do anything crazy. We just, I wanted to find good liquid that I love and just feature it. Just feature the liquid. Put put as much information as the producer will let me put on there, which honestly isn't much for the cognacs because we imported it directly of avoiding a lot of taxes and because mm -hmm. uh, it's an American product technically. So we avoided tariffs and taxes on finished goods from other countries and bottled it here, produced it here. So we, we were asked not to disclose the producer because our products are actually cheaper than what the producer's yeah. products are here. Well, you know, that's interesting. If you think about it, um, if I were one of those producers, I would probably go into it with the same sort of set of concerns um, that you just expressed they had. But then at the same time, I'm thinking particularly in this country, in this market, you know, there's a huge amount of room for brandy and cognac and, and things in, in that category that I think if you had more people doing interesting things to cognac, or let's say brandy generally, uh, that you have with folks like Barrel and Lost Lantern doing with whiskey, sure. I think it would interest, it, it would gain the interest of a lot of It would grow people. the category. Yeah. yeah, the category is so small right now that me sourcing product, which is, again, if you, if you source whiskey in America, it, it's going to be very difficult for that whiskey to be cheaper than the producer's own product on the shelf. It's the exact opposite in this case, where uh, cognac specifically... <clears throat> at the time was just cheap enough that it, or not not cheap, but just as inexpensive. Uh, cheap's a bad marketing word. That's the marketing in me. Uh, right. Speaking of bad marketing on the way here, is there anything more wasteful than a billboard ad for alcohol? <laughs> I cannot wrap my mind around the waste of thousands of dollars for a goddamn billboard in Houston for your Zen, your Zephyrgen or whatever the, the brand. I, it seems like such a waste. I cannot imagine spending that kind of money on a billboard when there are so many, for, for the same amount of money, you can get so much more out of almost any other thing you would do. That's exactly my point. There are so many things that are even uh, sending sample kits to certain influencers uh, will get more of an ROI. And that's the thing, is, and that's the hard part about marketing, period, is the ROI is hard to prove in marketing, right. except at a high level, like is the brand growing overall for the year? Okay, well then marketing must be working, but there's actually no way to know. Right. You know, it's hard to prove. Uh, but nothing to me is more of a waste or vain then, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and this is the cynical, I, and if I know a cynical person in this room, believe it or not, it's, it's Mark and not me, but <laughs> nothing seems like such a waste of money than, uh, than, a, than a billboard. But I forgot my original point, but, um, oh, it was just cheaper. The right. clinic was cheaper, yeah. So uh, you, Big Thirst Marketing, I've worked with you, Matt, and uh, you know we've worked for the last couple of years. We kind of have been in each other's circles, obviously. In fact, I think I think you and Matt are directly responsible for Golf Coast changing their name to Giant. I am glad to hear that because we did have a number of conversations with Carlos and a few other folks about the name and the tasting room and some of the things they were doing and some suggestions. And oftentimes when you're having those casual conversations, you never really know if any of that ends up being a part or a, or, um, a factor in, in a decision later sure. on down the road. So. Well, um, well, yeah, a lot of those conversations are flippant. 
Uh, they're just kind of thinking out loud. Uh, but I will say that uh, with a fair amount of certainty uh, that, it, that that is exactly the mm-hmm. case. That Because uh, we had the discussion. I actually didn't want them to change the name. Uh, I agreed with y'all's assessment. Your assessment, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is, this is a while ago, but the assessment was the name is Gulf Coast Distillers and still is on, on the DBA paperwork. But that <clears throat> you you're the only one of the only distilleries that I know of off the top of my head that has a product. The main core brand product is not the same name as the distillery. Like Buffalo Trace has Buffalo Trace, Sagamore has Sagamore, Still Austin, Balcones. Uh, which I agreed at the beginning. It should that should have been the thought. But now you're eight years in and you've developed a name. People know GCD. I was like, no, no, just leave it. It's too late now. And I got outvoted, of course, but uh, now it's Giant Texas Distillers, which I think is a great name. It works well. The brand's been reinvented. I don't know that it was so much a conversation about changing the name of the distillery as it was about promoting the name of the products made by the distillery in a way that made sense. Sure. Um, Which at the time, I don't think... um, the tasting room was open. I don't think it was there was any reference to Giant other than the products at the time. But I may be misremembering. There some was some the signage within that. the room, but it, not a lot. Yeah. Um, and you know, all the shirts, and then on, on the side of the distillery, yeah. it said Giant. Yeah. But um, I, my my assessment of the whole thing was just simply that you've been around long enough that you've pushed past this initial bad idea. Like it would have been great to consider this eight years ago, mm-hmm. and then name it accordingly. But um, but yeah, and I remember thinking like, yeah, Mark and Matt made a great idea, great suggestion, and uh, and it, and you made change. I'm glad to hear it, uh, and I hope it's it's working out well over there. Um, y- yeah, there's uh, <laughs> lots well, of obviously any change in the middle of a two to three year global pandemic is going to be hard to quantify after the fact. But uh, uh, I would disagree in this case. I think the the, <laughs> the change that has happened has been monumental. Yeah, yeah there's been a lot of behind the scenes monumental changes, yeah. and and the person that's in charge of marketing over there now, Michelle Hunley, is uh, incredible. Chief marketing officer for Gulf Coast. She's done. Uh, I, and I said this to her, to her face. She's the most resumeed person I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. Like you know, those people. I always told myself if I had the money and the time, I would just keep going to school. I would get mm-hmm. a degree in a, a bunch. And I've got a I've got three, but I would keep going. You know, this this woman has a bunch and is a jurist doctor in law. She was a prosecutor for years. She's worked in politics, and you have to know marketing if mm-hmm. you work in politics. Uh, her. They they could not have found a more qualified person. So, uh, yes, the the change has been monumental. But it all I think around the same time that I convinced Gulf Coast to relaunch the giant brand, you guys convinced them to change the name, and it was a great timing. Yeah, and I think if I remember correctly, a part of that conversation uh, revolved around the fact that they have so many products, so many brands. Um, some their own, some not their own, that if you don't know the difference, it's just lost in this big cacophony of different brands. And you don't know what's what, who belongs to what, what things are, are related to each other, and all that sort of thing. So. Yeah, they they own quite a bit, for sure. Uh, and, and a big part of a lot of, and a lot of people don't know this. So I would venture to say that most of the brands on the market, for those listening, here's a little insider information. For most of the brands that exist, they're brands that are not produced at their facility, meaning the brand's own facility. Uh, co-packing is a very profitable side of the business. Uh, one of the greatest facilities to be built in the last eight years was Bardstown Bourbon Company. <clears throat> they bottle for everyone you can possibly imagine. Uh, it's usually from a case rate fee of like either $8 a case, I've seen as high as $18 a case. Gulf Coast bottles and produces for a lot of other people. Uh, Iron Root, before when we started Gregarious, Iron Root was my bottler. They bottled for me. Uh, and they bottle for uh, Nico, uh, who I love, mm-hmm. Nico Martini's brand, um, Grayson. Uh, and then the guys over at uh, Bourbon Real Talk, uh, no, someone say whiskey, they have their brand there called Unallocated. So it, it's a very big part of the business. So a lot of people will own the intellectual property uh, of a product. They own the brand itself and will just bottle at a facility f- for them. Uh, and it, you know, it saves you a lot of 
SGNA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For sure. So, um, all right. So you have taken over as CEO, uh, which is one hell of a title. Um, and you're now producing. I actually found this brand first time I ever saw it, thanks to Dragon uh, Spirits. Mm -hmm. uh, Lamar gave me this bottle. Really? Yes. It's still sitting on my shelf. A while back, before my time, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like a month before, like okay. very recently. Yeah, interesting. <clears throat> he, uh, Lamar was here in town and g gave me this bottle. Uh, and yeah, I, 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 I have not even opened it. Well, you're about to then. You so. want to do, you want to do, uh, so I brought, old, however you want to, okay. whatever order or. So let's, yeah. let's, I feel like this is going to affect our palates greatly. Let's do mm -hmm. the old granddad first. Normally okay. we do a special bottle last, but okay. uh, you said you were a fan I, of old granddad? I am, yeah. It's, it's probably, it's definitely in my, my top three go-tos. Um, you know, I feel like you always have to have a... Smells fantastic. A set of like, if you go into a bar and you don't want to take the time to think through or, you know, it's hard for me to, to sit at a bar and not examine and analyze the entire back bar for 30 minutes before I make a choice, right? Um, old Granddad is so solid. And I, th I think it goes for a decent eight, 900 bucks a bottle now? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it was because like- Because people like, are all over it, so. Yeah, I mean, people go apeshit over this stuff, and back then it was probably 10 bucks a bottle, yeah. something ridiculous. So, side question, because I know that you have managed to find a relatively large number of these old bottles. Yeah. Um, I assume some of it's just from being around and creating a, a pretty big network, but how much time do you spend on that versus mm, do not, they just kind of magically appear? Not much anymore. Um, there are different times of the year that we do. Like for the, the for those who are watching this, which is – this airs tomorrow. Tickets for the Whiskey Social just went on sale as of midnight last night. And uh, what we normally do is we try to feature a bunch of vintage bottles at the event. Mm -hmm. um, the tickets are not tied to the alcohol itself, so we are giving away the booze. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, so a couple times a year we'll we'll make some large purchases at auction, and there's monthly auctions, and I get notifications for it. So if there's a couple of auction websites that are going up, I'll I'll peruse mm -hmm. what's what's going to go available, and kind of plan for it, uh, and then we like last year I think we poured and emptied somewhere around forty thousand dollars in dusties mm -hmm. at the event, and just. Uh, I mean, it was some crazy number. It was some stupid number, but w it was the first event back from COVID. So we were just we had a lot of time to peruse and maybe bought, maybe buy a little too much. But um, yeah, it, it doesn't take a lot of effort now. I mean, it used to. Uh, but I hate to say it this way, but you know, everyone's got their plug, mm -hmm. where you have your three or four main stores you'll go to, or you know, once you know where to get stuff, then you just go back and say, hey, what do you got available? What's going on? But it's good. It's it's great. Old. Uh, I had this great conversation with Jared Hempstead at Balconies about they outlawed somewhere around eighty two to eighty five. They outlawed the use of horse shit, like 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 manure in the fermentation process, for obvious reasons. Uh, and there's been all this speculation about why Dusties all have a signature taste, something different about them. Mm. Like the the <laughs> you know like dunder pits right like you get yeah. bugs and and this or that and he goes they at one point in time there's a lot of this debate over it's like old growth oak or new growth oak or the grains were non GMO or whatever the case might be he's like there's a portion of it where they were using manure during the fermentation process because of all the bacteria and mm -hmm. the, I I don't know the whole ins and outs of it but I he goes it was around 85, 86 that bourbon changed and there may have been because of that outlaw of... of I didn't know any anything about that. Uh, yeah, it, you, you, you could probably do some research on it and talk to someone like Chuck Cowdery a little bit more. Or, but I want to say it was uh, some of the yeast component during the fermentation process to, to really kick off the bacterial growth and the, uh, the conversion uh, starches to sugars was uh, manure. So I was like, oh, that's, I mean, I don't taste manure, but if it is, it's 
It's good shit. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've talked about this on the show, and we kind of mentioned it, but I, I actually left uh, Gulf Coast Distillers. I'm no longer the director of product development as of a week ago. Um, uh, I specifically left to free up bandwidth. Uh, we had intentions of doing an agave social mm-hmm. that never came to fruition. A big part of that was time. Uh, we don't have any other staff to help with it. And two, there's a little bit of a language barrier trying to explain what the event is when there's not really anything like it here. Right. So uh, it it just fell apart. And I, 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 I filed the trademark, bought the website. So it does need to happen, uh, but we've just had bandwidth issues. And then, so to focus on gregarious and prideful, we're working on new state distribution. Um, <clears throat> I think we're in eight states now, uh, officially eight states, but technically 40 something, if you include our online retailers who shipped, which by the way, I need to talk to you about something. <laughs> so one of the things Big Thirst Marketing pioneered was somehow to your door shipping? Sort of. Um I don't understand, and people keep saying you need to talk to Big Thirst because this is we have a distributor in Canada that wants us. Okay, called Evergreen Beverage. Uh, you need a special permit from FedEx to ship samples to a distributor or to a liquor store, and it has to be someone with a license. Gulf Coast does not have that license, and it's been like two months process trying to get approved for it so that we can send our products to customs at Canada to get to the distributor. The only thing stopping us from a multiple country badge of honor is I can't get my bottles to Canada in a timely fashion with FedEx or DHL. Hmm. And that's because of customs or because of? Well, I could, I could pack a box that says alcohol on it to FedEx. Mm-hmm. It will not make it to Canada. I have to have permission from FedEx to officially ship alcohol. And so if I give them a package that's labeled alcohol with the custom declarations and stuff on it, it's not going to even make it to customs because I'm not authorized to ship with FedEx. So you just need either through UPS or FedEx uh, a spirit shipping um, permit. or When I say permit, I'm internal to the company. Sure. And I have one with UPS. And I got to tell you, it was one of the most challenges, challenging things I've ever gone through. It's a nightmare. And part of it is because I think there are very few people in the company that are even aware that they can ship spirits with the right um, things in place. So getting to the right person and then, you know, even on the website, it's because they've done it for years, everything is set up for wine shipping. And... Spirit shipping is not the same. The rules are not the same. The states are not the same. I don't know much about Canada. I did ship a couple of bottles to the UK some years ago through FedEx, and that was, I kid you not, a 19-hour ordeal just to work through all of the the paperwork and bureaucracy to get it done. Just to ship a non-alcoholic package to the UK. We shipped something for Sam, to Sam Hewen for the second episode we did, and I had to say it was personal belongings or memorabilia or something mm-hmm. and it still took too long and it was like 300 bucks it was a, it was a nightmare mm-hmm. so i guess in short you're saying you if i give these bottles to big thirst marketing you guys can get them to canada <laughs> no I, i'm not saying that uh, right now we're only shipping in the united states and to be very clear we don't we don't do the shipping um, we're just the e-commerce portal that manages the transaction. And, and technically, the transaction happens at the retailer in the location where the bottle's being sold from. And that's what makes it legal. Uh, right Which is now, also how we sell products at the social the night of. Right. We have a QR code you can order from your phone. We actually have someone that can take the order there. But it's no different than right. if you were to order something on Total Wine's website now and then go yeah. pick it up in store. Right. So the, the difference is with Total Wine or what you're doing, that's delivery, and it's local, so it has to be within the county area, right? No, 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 no delivery. You have to go pick it up well, in store. Okay, right. But but for like Drizzly and those kind of yes. companies, yeah, what I'm yeah. saying is they only operate within the county. They can't cross county lines. With shipping, it's relatively cross-country, but 
And, and we're set up much like most of the other online DTC companies are in that the product ships from a retailer in a state to a consumer in a state that can legally receive spirits from a retailer in another state. Right. So it's not every state. It's not everywhere. And yeah, we order our, – our, our products are available online through Bourbon Outfitter and Sealbox. Okay. Sealbox can ship to like – 20 states legally bourbon outfitters will ship to like 40 states yeah <laughs> my experience is most of them will ship almost anywhere sure under the right circumstances we don't want them to do that right because we want to be legal and right. uphold the law and hey, you not want to be part of some class yeah. action i'm all for pushing boundaries and changing laws but i don't want to be breaking them sure. right so Ultimately, that's their decision, and we can't control it. But in our agreements with them, we're very clear that if you're shipping illegally to a state that, that well, that it's illegal, then you're subject to losing your, your deal with us. Um, what's great about D.C., Sealbox or anybody else, we don't use Sealbox. We use, we use a different retailer there. But as a producer, as a supplier, you don't have to have a distributor to ship product to a retailer in D.C. So you get to keep more directly. margin. Right. More margin. You're going to spend some money on shipping. Um, and it's not really, honestly, it's not as much about the margin as it is about the ease of just being able to get product there sure. and get it out. The other thing is with shipping spirits, if it costs $20 to ship a $20 bottle of booze across the country, uh, is it really worth it to the consumer? If it's a $120 bottle or it's a rare bottle or something that somebody really, really wants for some reason, they can't get it in their local area, it might make sense to spend that kind of money. But for a lot of bottles, it's, it's just not cost effective. If you add the cost of distribution into that, then it's just another layer of, well, I got bottles online I can sell to people in some states, but they're too expensive for anybody to, to really spend any time or money on them. Yeah, so. I, you actually just reminded me. Um, <clears throat> we advertise that we sell through Sealbox and Bourbon Outfitters, like, but we don't actually have a portal on our website. Um, yeah, it, it's something that's evolved quite a bit over the last few years, and I think there's been a, some progress in terms of recognizing the level of stupidity behind it. Mm -hmm. You can order as much wine as you want to your door. In fact, we're uh, we're part of a, a club, Day Negotiator, whatever. We'll buy uh, twelve bottles of wine at, at a time, a, a case mm -hmm. delivered to our house, no problem. But you can't get a bottle of, of right. whiskey. Yeah, and ultimately, <clears throat> my goal is is not for just retailers to be able to ship to more people everywhere, but for producers themselves to ship directly. Right. Just like wineries, right? Just like every other product in the country, with the exception of, of beer, I think that's correct. Um, you can't order beer. I don't think you can ship beer, um, or, so or ship it may wine. be it may be that you can in some limited circumstances. You can ship cigarettes. You can ship firearms, cigar, cigar, uh, yeah. cigars, um, drugs, uh, prescription drugs. Sure, yeah. sure. Or or other drugs, yeah, I yeah, suppose. Yeah. Long There's some places it, that'll ship um, weed to your house. Yeah, um, olive oil. Right, right. Yeah. Barbecue uh, sauce. Yeah, it is Texas. Exactly. So, um, all right. So, so you guys handle the. Uh, and, and Matt actually reached out to me whenever we launched with Sealbox, and it was like, "Hey, we should discuss." And I had intended to. That's part of the reason I. All of this to boil down like. I, there's too much on my plate. I need more time to do these things. Mm -hmm. So gregarious grump, prideful goat are still my babies. I'm still going to be focused on these things. But also managing all of the other products for Golf Coast yeah. was just too much. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I left. Um, I, I We are focusing on new state expansion and new country expansion, and mm -hmm. we can figure out that. Uh, and, yeah, I'll be going to Chicago next week. Uh we got a thing going on with Sam Morell and Mark Norman. Their whiskey's coming. Um, it, it's just, it's it's a lot. It's time consuming. Mm -hmm. it takes up your whole time. I mean, that's what you're here for. You're actually here in Houston to push Susto. Yeah. But, you know, I, I do a lot of other things, too. And not that I have any more time than you, but if and when you get around to um, Agave Social again, let me know. I'd love to... to 
be involved in some way in, in, in helping with that. We, I, I, I want so badly to do it simply because there is, uh, over the last few years, I, I think some people think of me and HBS as being a bourbon group or a bourbon guy. But I started with scotch. I love mezcal and citol. I hate tequila. Uh, hate vodka. Uh, but rum, our first mm-hmm. products we released were rum. Uh, and then cognac and I mean there's there's a world of fantastic spirits out there and yeah the whiskey social is my baby it'll all I mean the seventh annual event is happening this this year Uh, I would love to see some agave and we can cut the event in half like let's for our first agave social let's just keep it small let's let's put it around 600 people that event venue could could do that's almost a third we could do 600 yeah. people, no problem. Yeah, and I think the the education that you could do along with it, uh, there, there's so much to do. Um, I think it, I think it could could be really really well designed. Are you guys still you're still doing Big Thirst at the same time? Yes. So uh, Big Thirst is really three different companies that are all related but structurally separate. There's marketing, consulting, and then the e-commerce company. Most of my time is spent on consulting outside of Susto now, and most of my time within that is really on operational type things. Anything from, you know, I've been managing the expansion project at Milam and Green. Um, I work with a number of distilleries who are in the startup phase, either with their permitting, equipment selection process, product development, things like that. I support Joe. Uh, on sales and distribution work. That's really his area. Sure. He's an expert in that. You know, any of us that have been in this business for some period of time have a lot of exposure to it. But, sure. You know, I let him, you know. <coughs> and Matt's on the marketing yeah, side. Matt's <coughs> primarily marketing and then e commerce. So we kind of each have our, our little areas. We back each other up. And, you know, part of this was because we all seem to pass each other on different projects around the state and we've all known each other for a long time and you know during at some point early on during the pandemic we were talking about it thought well instead of doing this all separately what if we kind of rolled it into sort of a one-stop turnkey um, where somebody can come to one place and get whatever it is they need not pay for stuff they don't need so everything we do is really custom to what the the client wants or sure. needs right so you know and that's what kind of led into the relationship with susto and i'm excited about it because it gives me an opportunity to work in a different area of the industry which is importing um than what i've had experience with before you know production of mezcal versus production of bourbon or gin or anything else obviously there are differences but it's production uh, distribution is distribution. You know, being able to get involved in the ins and outs, the bureaucracy of importing, and all of the other things that go along with that is not something a lot of people have the opportunity to do. And so, you guys so why not? import. It's based here in Texas. So the the company is divided really into two parts. There's a Mexican company. Um, which is where the production occurs right. in, in Oaxaca, or actually just southeast of Oaxaca, and then the U.S. company, which is the import company. So what's a little bit different about Susto than most mezcals that you find here is we own the NOM, we're independent, We, although we lease the agave fields that we farm the agave from, we own all of the production, everything's done in-house, there's no white labeling, um, we do use a... Can I open it? Yeah, please. We use a bottler in, in Oaxaca, uh, but we're actually working right now to sort of map out all of the palenques in San Dionisio Cotepec, which is the area where we're located. You know, there's an app that will help with that. Yes. Um, but we actually have an intern from Texas State getting ready to start. She's going to go down there, and she's a GIS and mapping specialist. And we're going to very specifically map them out. And these are mostly small places that don't do any 
any sort of importing and may not even sell outside of their local communities. But our intent is to build a cooperative bottling facility somewhere in the middle of that that's, that's easy for those folks to get to and use rather than having to go in and use a, a big, uh, you know, large commercial firm in, in Oaxaca. So yeah, I think you should steer away from that for sure. Um, <clears throat> I was talking to, oh, how do I say this? <laughs> uh, to be careful here. Uh, there are, okay, <clears throat> so there are current, the current environment of Mexican spirits is an interesting one. How much, how much is this bottle? Um, retail, anywhere from probably 39 to 42. Okay. That is incredibly low priced. It is. Yeah. And, and for a reason, and that is, let me be thoughtful yeah, about yeah, how yeah, I say yeah. this. I'm trying. Well, so Crispin, <laughs> sure. who is our mescalero, who his family has been making mezcal for at least, uh, as far as I know, at least several generations, um, we're not just buying this from him. Mm -hmm. We have made him a full partner in the company. So whereas some companies are just buying and jacking up prices on liquid. It's not just the jacking up of the prices. They, they, they say that nothing sells more than sex except nostalgia. Right. There is something um, traditional and exotic in a lot of uh, Mexican bottles, whether it's tequila, agave, sotol, there's something exotic, and then you've got a collection of tequila on your back bar, and you, you can you can see all the different shapes, and, and none of them are real practical for bars, but because they're so, a skeleton in a sombrero is so exotic yeah. that you're like, you wanna collect them all like Pokemon, you know? I'm not a fan of the novelty bottles at all. That's the word I'm looking um, for. Yeah. Novelty. That being said, I mean, if you look at our bottle, we do have the, the skeletons, the kalakas. No, on, no, on no. This there. is very toned uh, down. No, but, but yeah, it, it's, we're not a novelty bottle, yes. but, but the imagery is very similar. The, there, so. is, there is a, a, a thing that's happening in Mexican spirits right now, specifically threefold. Additives. Uh, I was having this great discussion with this guy, uh, David Woolley, who used to work for Sazerac. And we were talking, we were at St. Arnold's Brewery here in Houston, and he and his specific job is to create these large bulk um, commodity products that are not very loved, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> and he's like, I, we, we gotta come up with a smoky, a smoky tequila. And I was like, I got this. I work in marketing. I got this. Uh, what's the Spanish word for charcoal? And he Googles it, and he's like, oh, tequila carbon. What a great name. And I was like, yeah, you're welcome. That'll be $20,000. Uh, tequila carbon is such – and it's just – it's like a smoky tequila flavored. Uh, but the name tequila carbon is like – it, it, it fits, mm -hmm. like it's perfect for right. this. It, specifically in Mexican spirits, uh, bottle novelty, price hike, additives. Yeah. Those three things are really saturating yeah. the market right now. Well, so with mezcal, it's interesting because you don't find a lot of bottles in the $40 mm -mm, range. At all. And when you do, oftentimes mm -hmm. they are not what I would consider to be quality. Uh, now... I understand the higher cost of some of the mezcals out there because they're using agaves that are not commercially farmed, that are hard to get to, sure. that are not as common in the place where they happen to be using them. Um, there are a lot of things that push this price up. But to go from $40 to $120 a bottle, there's a lot of money bullshit in there. Yeah, a lot of a bullshit. Lot of bullshit. In there. Yeah. No, we we did an episode on this mm -hmm. and I actually got into I say I got into an argument with someone uh on the Facebook world, a guy named David Lozano. I probably shouldn't say his name. Uh David Lozano. Uh so we I say we got into an argument. Shout out to David. Yeah. But I I wasn't arguing as much as he was fucking yelling at me. Uh he is very passionate. Yes. He he's he's not a bad guy. He's a super guy. 
He's not a bad guy. He's a good guy. He, he's overly passionate and is, uh, at times, I think, unreasonable. Uh, but he was one of the ones that just fused me as the bourbon guy. And one of the things that has happened, in, specifically in Mexican spirits, is the general rule of thumb, and I've beat this to death, so if anyone listening to this has heard, heard me talk about it, feel free to skip ahead five minutes. But, you know, 30, 35% markup margin somewhere in there is a pretty good rule of thumb at each tier. Uh, but I talked to a, a mescalero who's selling his product to the States at like $19 a bottle, and it's on the shelf for like 70 Mm-hmm. And that doesn't track. No, it doesn't make any sense at all. And so we, I asked him, I went through his distribution tier. I know what retailers charge. And same thing like with the cognac. We imported the cognac ourselves. We mm-hmm. cut out an entire layer of cost. But importation is 10 15% usually. Some higher. But what we were seeing is there was, you know, if I produce a product here in this, in uh, a whiskey, Prideful Goat, Whatever the shelf price is, if we sell it to a distributor for about half that, it's give or take pretty close. Mm-hmm. But it's not what's happening with Mexican spirits. We're seeing uh, mescaleros and soteleros sell their product at not half to the retail price, a fourth mm-hmm. of the retail price. Where's that money going? The money's going to, in some cases, the importer, the distributor. They're getting very wide, abnormally mm-hmm. large margins. But they're being marketed as, oh, the agave is hard to get. And like you just said, it's very, very old agave. It's you know 18 years old, some of these plants, 20 years old, some of these plants. I understand that. But to me, that feels like more of a crime. That feels more manipulative to the market than, say, a rock or a Kendall Jenner tequila. A celebrity branded tequila, it's easy to point the blame at someone. Mm-hmm. It's easy to say that they're uh, appropriating. But a lot of these Mexican producers will approach them because it's a two-way street. I get right. to sell 300,000 cases of right. tequila. It happens all the time. To me, I feel like it's a much bigger crime. It's way more heinous. You can leave this part in. Way more heinous uh, for us to be selling off the backs of these mescaleros and soteleros as the third-generation families. Their whole life is this, the blah, blah, blah. But the money's not going to them. Right. And when we actually talked to some mescaleros and soteleros about buying bulk liquid... We saw some liquid that is on the shelf, same exact liquid, for 150 a bottle. We could give them twice the amount at the supplier level, and we would be on the shelf at 80. Mm-hmm. So we could pay them double what they were paid for the liquid for this $150 brand, right. and we could be on the shelf at 80. And you're still making a healthy margin. And we're still in the making industry, it. yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I, I feel when I see a, a, a quality $40 mezcal, it's fantastic. It's unheard of. But there's this big, large push between dis, the distribu- distribution tier, going into bars, doing these uh, tastings and, and trainings with their bartenders. They're pushing Mexican spirits, our premium spirits. We need to respect them. They need to be 100. You know, we need to understand that they're, they're worth 150 bucks. I understand that. But... I, and I don't disagree with you. Yeah. The, the, I, I think you can easily make an argument that a good quality 20-year-old plant, they have to go out and harvest it by hand. Okay, cool. I'm with you at 100 bucks a bottle. For some bottles. For some bottles. Not for the range of bottles that, that, that are out I think there. we see. Yeah. But, but, but the money's not going back to them. Right. You're selling it off their back and then keeping the money, which to me is way more heinous. And I tried to explain that to David, and David was not having it. I'm just pointing out that I see it happening, yeah. and they're like, "Oh, what do you know? You're a, you're a bourbon yeah. Facebook guy." Okay, so right. you know, you know, it's interesting. I think, um, and I'm going to qualify this first by saying, I know a lot of brand owners in every category of spirit who are absolutely fan up, fantastic, stand up, honest, ethical, excellent people. But if you look at people who are specifically brand owners versus p- people who are also producers and importers of products like this. Sure. I think that you'll probably see a difference in the way that pricing works. I feel like there are on the balance more unscrupulous brand owners who could give a shit about the product, 
the producer or anything along the way other than selling that product at a hyper jacked up price in the market here. Absolutely. Uh, and I'll tell you, so one of my roles, one of the responsibilities I have is presenting our products to large chain accounts across the country. If we go into a liquor barn or a, a Big Daddy's has like 12 accounts in Florida. Specs has 200 accounts here in Texas. BevMo is in three states and they have like 500 accounts. One of the things that conversation I've seen happen time and time again, no matter where you're at, is this is a popular brand that we have nothing to do with. Can you make a copy of that? Mm -hmm. Can you mimic this? Can you create something close to it? And here's an even bigger issue for me, whether it's a distributor or anybody else, people who are taking advantage of crossing the three tiers. That doesn't bother me as much. What bothers me about it is I try and do things right, which means when I see somebody else competing with me who is crossing tiers illegally, they're taking advantage of something that I'm not getting the advantage of because I'm trying to do it right. But couldn't you take advantage of it if you wanted to? Um, Can you give me an example? Because this is who I'm thinking well, of. Well, yeah. Morgan Weber. Morgan Weber owns a few bars through a trust, right? The, the, mm -hmm. it, it's all legal on paper. On paper. On paper, it's all legal. Uh, but he also owns Marfa Spirits Company, a distillery out in Marfa, Texas that makes it all. Uh, he's transparent about it. He's honest about it. That doesn't bother me at all. Anyone who can gain this, so it's like taxes. Look, Elon Musk pays no taxes. Hey, man, I also try not to pay. Is I pay? I try to pay the least amount of taxes I can, just like anyone else would. Are I was you trying thinking, to buy Twitter too. Yeah, no. Okay. I was thinking more about a distributor or a retailer who is also owns and sells a brand of their own. But that's still a good example. And. Are there ways to game the system to sure. meet the letter of the law while flouting the spirit of law? Sure. But it still seems a little unfair to me. Oh, it's definitely unfair that, because yeah. they, have, they have the money behind them. Right. So that being said, I am all for and and um, I got in a big discussion with Dan Garrison about this years ago at a hearing at the Capitol on, I don't remember exactly what it was, but um, my position was that the state should change the law and require or, or allow at least a de minimis amount of crossover between the tiers. Can you Google and, de minimis real quick? <laughs> yeah. Can you spell it? Yeah. Um, that feels like three words you said at once. Well, so... I don't know about all this. I, I feel like most states will allow somebody to own a up to usually five or ten percent across tiers um, in those particular states. And you know, in Texas, we have what they call the one share rule, where technically you cannot own one share of a business that is in a tier other than what your basic tier is, right? Sure. And I was advocating to change that and allow some amount of crossover. And, and Why? Dan was – because if I own 10% of a restaurant, for example, and I own 100% of a distillery, um, is it realistic that I'm going to go into that restaurant and – have any market power sure. in pushing them to carry my products over other products? No, not, no, not but, at 10%. But Papa's Brothers would be. Well, if I own 51%, then sure, you would see my products in that bar to the exclusion of my competitors. Right. And that's what the whole purpose of the three-tier system is. Well, sure. it's a portion of what the purpose is about, right? One of the things we've talked so. about in Texas is – there's all this talk about Peter Luger's 100-year-old steakhouse in New York. But in Houston, like the, one of the number one click things you get on articles here is the openings and closures. Our turnover rate for restaurants and bars, there's no mm -hmm. his. In fact, the most historical uh, restaurants and bars in Houston are chains. Mm -hmm. It's Papa, jo uh, Papa Brothers or uh, what's the one, Gringos, uh, the, the Ibarras. Uh, they're the only ones that have been able to make it work for decades. Everyone else is like in and out, in and out, in and mm -hmm. out. 
So, yeah, I mean, if you were to change that rule, it would have a massive footprint yeah. in the market in regards to... It would make a lot of people legal in terms of what their holdings are. I mean, technically, in, in Texas... You're saying it's already happening. They just need oh, yeah, to... Oh, yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and typically, the way it happens is, you know, through a legal patchwork of different companies... Uh, like trusts? Yeah, trusts, or, or even just enough enough holding companies or whatnot in between that nobody's ever going to go far, go that far back and, and check, right? Sure. So, um, I mean, it, it's, it would legitimize what's already happening, sure. It might turn the volume up a little bit. It might make it a little bit, it might exacerbate it a little bit. If it was fully legal, people, more people would try. Uh, I mean, I've had plenty of people, uh, we know someone, uh, Nico approached me about potentially working on a large chain volume for specific restaurant group mm -hmm. um it happens well and there's a lot of grayer there too right because as a, a restaurant you could partner with a, a supplier to private label something for your restaurant sure it's essentially the same thing right and that's exactly what yeah. it would be i mean you're essentially yeah partnering uh, uh honestly you think talk, talking out loud this really gets back to uh, one of one of the things that I care most about in this industry that I think we talked about before, and that's transparency. I mean, that same goes. I hadn't thought about it in terms of this particular discussion, but as long as there's complete transparency, I'm okay with most things in this business. Uh, I'm the I'm the opposite. It's like personal freedoms. I don't care if you want to do mushrooms in your apartment God. or acid. <laughs> On vacation like I these things don't affect me if they don't affect me I don't care and as a small producer although technically I'm not a producer uh, you're one of those brand owners that I'm one of the price I'm one of the brand owners yeah. that manipulates yeah. the market yeah right. that it it's not it, it, it I think there's room because I think that the people who are manipulating the system fundamentally are creating inferior products well and let me and be clear I don't think Let's do. Let's do. We got time for okay. one more part. I want to do this. Right. What are these called? Um, they are copitas. They're from Oaxaca, and um, I thought it would be interesting because I had be better with, if it was a skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> with, with a friend recently, we had some mezcal and some sotol, and we had each of them in glass and in these little uh, earthen copitas. Sure. And we had each of them in these little earthen copitas and, and glass. And my experience was that with the mezcal, there was a pretty big difference in, in the taste between the glass and the copita. With the sotol, it was huge. Huge difference. Uh, and I'm sure it's not about mezcal and sotol. It's probably every product has a, a different sort of delta in between. But I thought it was an interesting way to start talking about palate and perception and all that sort of thing because we're drinking the same thing out of a different vessel and we're getting an entirely different experience from it. Yeah, I, I, I think that that applies to some things and in other things it's bullshit. For instance, a Miller Lite out of a red solo cup at a baseball game is going to taste <laughs> the same as in a fancy beer glass. No doubt. Uh, so again, it, it all comes back to what you're drinking and how that drink was made. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Brandon. I do you think the same way with like aluminum bottles though? Because I do feel like no, there's no, a little no. bit of a difference. Yeah, in yeah, taste yeah, yeah. You there. taste like it because it tastes like aluminum. Tastes like aluminum. Like, okay, just making sure. Well, and yeah, so I just meant fancy glass shapes. There's a lot of beer snobs out there that'll tell you, oh, you have to drink a stout oh, out yeah, of I, this I, glass I, versus that glass. Uh, even if you talk to breweries and how they recarbonate certain products, the recarbonation isn't an exact science. It's largely a broad brush. It's kind of like, uh, let's throw a thousand milligrams of Tylenol at whatever you're, you're feeling. It may be overkill, but it's gone. That's all that matters. That's how a lot of recarbonation is done. It's not an exact science. And when you go to open your beer and you let it sit there for 20 minutes, or if you open it and immediately hard pour it, gets all that head on it, it's still going to taste great after that head settles. All right. I agree with you 100% on that, especially with the beer and the, and the, and the Red Solo Cups. And in fact, uh, just last night, I was with Mike G. He did a, a tasting of of Muscat That's someone who gets tasting. beat up a lot, too. I feel bad for him. Uh, <laughs> I, he yeah. gave me a bottle of his Satole. I've yet to open it. I gave you a bottle too, didn't I? Did you? Is it the same batch? 
actually, you gave me a small bottle. He gave me a half bottle. That bastard. I have them both. So, so I look like I look bad. Now. No, no, no. You gave it to me, and then he. I think he came to the social. He he came to something and and handed it to me, and I. I thought, gave it to you out at Crowded Barrel when we were there for whatever that was in Austin. Yes, that was and when we were was, there. For, he was there that afternoon, but I didn't know he was going to be there. I think so you, I maybe you gave it yeah. to me. Uh, maybe he didn't give it to me. He, but it's his liquid. We worked on that together. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of story there. But anyway, so with him last night for this blind tasting, and we were tasting in those little you know half ounce plastic cups. Ugh. And I thought, you know. This really is terrible. It's fine for for going into specs and trying out something at the barrel on a Saturday evening, sure. but it really just kills everything about the experience, about the aroma, about the taste, everything. We uh, we we ran a little long, and and I'm gonna leave it to Brandon to trim out all the trash talk we did. Okay. Uh, but let's have one more pour. I, you've not had one of my products. I haven't. No. Um, so, okay. Actually. I think I had your very first rum. Okay. I think. This was fantastic, by the way. Thank you. You still, and we can do it after the fact, but I want you to taste that exact same thing in the glass. Okay. Ne- like next to it, not sure. like three days from now. So, uh, Jamaica rum. I actually uh, found out that you wouldn't call it Jamaican rum. You would call it Jamaica rum, Barbados rum, not Baja rum, or Baja, Baja, whatever. You wouldn't say Barbadian rum. Barbados is the country, and then you would call it, I think, Baja? Baja? Bahan. Bahan? Bahan, Yeah. Anyways, so 17-year-old Clarendon, um, we moved production facilities from Iron Root to Gulf Coast Distillers uh, last year. Uh, 17 year I don't believe is available let me give you a little more because please it's a good mezcal on there uh, Dunder so there's this is a funk bomb right, let me ask you while you're telling me about it have okay. you had the funk um, sorry have you have you had the funk I'm gonna steal your glass yeah. okay uh, what do you mean have I had the funk it's a Jamaica pot still rum. It's called, called the, the funk, funk. Oh, okay yeah. I have not had it um, you probably I don't know if you know Dave Schmier but um no. You know of him. He's a big, he's a big cream cheese fan, right? <laughs> Indeed, he is. <laughs> he's the guy behind Proof and Wood. He developed. Um, um, I feel really proud of that joke. Schmier. That is good. Um, the the president, the senator. Um, oh, yeah. yes. The um, uh, um, the um, shit, the rye that he developed and sold off a few years ago. Um, He's got a long just, track record yeah. of, uh, I mean, the senator and the, uh, what's the other one? The, uh, the president. Uh, yeah, presidential yeah. dram. And they, uh, Tumbling Dice. Um, yeah, he's got a long track record. Tumbling Dice stuff. is great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He is one of the best at sourcing really cool shit and putting it in a bottle sure. that, that, that I know. But he has a, a rum, a pot still Jamaica rum. Called the Funk. Called the Funk. And it is the highest ester funkiest rum I've ever had in my life. I will challenge... It's, it is crazy, and if I had known you hadn't had it, I would have brought a bottle with me. I will, I will challenge that. We've got this uh, 27-year New Yarmouth that is mm-hmm. uh, 100% column still. This, uh, the Clarendon, I believe is, is uh, if I remember correctly, is pot still at 136.8. I dig it. It is a funk bomb, for sure. Uh, to go from the Waterford, uh, the, the, the tempered mild mannered Clark Kent of drinks to the Jamaican uh Polly Shore <laughs> wild card Ooh. Charlie Sheen funk. Yeah, uh, this is fantastic. I dig it. So I know this is an unfair question. Okay. Is this your favorite of of the gregarious Oh no. No no no. Or I, do you do you put them in order or do you try and stay I, away from I, that? I don't put it in order. I I I look back on the original releases differently than I did at the time that they were released. Um, meaning I had originally liked the Belize and the Foursquare more. I don't. I like our current Belize and our 16-year Foursquare better than the 12-year we did and 14-year we did last time. So, yeah. Um, 
in retrospect, my opinions have changed on a few of them, but this is not my favorite. The, the, I love this. It's it's funky for a different reason. This is month long fermentation in an open vat, not Dunder style. So uh, Cypress fermenters month long open fermentation. It's high ester, but it's not. It's high ester for a different reason than say the New Yarmouth, mm-hmm. which is uh, Dunder style funky funk uh, column still. This is pot still. And what I love about these things is that there's nothing like it in Texas. No, our, this our, is, our independent bottlers or our independent bottlings are wholly unique to the southern part of the United States. Yeah, this is really, really excellent. And I've had I wouldn't say a lot, but I feel like recently I've had more than the average number of unfortunate rums. Oh really? Yeah. Uh, there, I feel like rum is going through a slight renaissance. Uh, it's very, there's a lot of great, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, uh, Holmes Key. Mm-hmm. Um, Eric Kay has has produced some great independent bottlings of rum. <sighs> no, I don't give me, I think there's great rum. There's better rum out there than I've ever had in the last number of years. Yes. But I just in the last couple of months, I feel like I've had some oh, really oh, mediocre really? rums. Yeah. Um, care to name names since no. we're shit talking? No. <laughs> Separate and apart from all that, because I know we're out of time, you mentioned before we started that there was something you wanted to save until we, we started talking oh, man, related to my last trip to Houston. And I'm really curious as to what it was. Oh, was that that you convinced Golf Coast to change its name? Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Gotcha. So I, I wanted to make it clear on camera that uh, you, you you kind of came in, you and Matt came in to kind of, I guess, field some business and, and work on some things. And you said some things that were kind of flippant mm-hmm. that actually made quite the impact. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to give you and Matt credit because uh, Carlos respects you guys greatly. And you guys said some things that meant the world that changed. And, and I say this with all sincerity, Carlos is a very busy, very wealthy man who is working on more companies than I think people realize. Mm-hmm. He's not just a coffee guy. He's not just Gulf Coast Distillers. The bandwidth is as as hard as it is for me to remember people the night of the social. Carlos is times a thousand. Mm-hmm. So whenever you say something to him, even flippantly, that causes him to change how he does business, that is saying something. Well, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate knowing it, and you it's know, harder than you realize. <laughs> well, we've been around this, and, and you too. We've all been around this business for a long time, and we we see things. Sure. And you know, if there's anything I can do to provide something to somebody that might be helpful, I want to do it. Sure. Because I want everybody to be successful in this business, except for the people who are assholes and cheaters, and you know, yeah, yeah, like, you know, fuck those bad guys. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. For people who are trying, for people who do good shit and are good people and, you know, like, it's a complex, hard business. I don't know everything about it. I learn something new every fucking day, no matter how long I've been doing this. And sometimes people call me for advice about something. I'm like, why the fuck are you calling me? What do I know? Sure. Um, But we all have experiences that we can share with other people about the you know, particular things that, that we've learned along the way. And if we can do that, why wouldn't we? Th- that's exactly how it should be. No matter who you are or what realm you're in, if someone has a thought on something based off their own experience, listen to it. Take the information and then make a decision. But there, there, there are things, like for instance, I- I'll give you a great example. There's a very large uh, retailer that is known for, say, lower-priced commodity products that wants to get into the premium space and has and is making great efforts to, to produce higher quality, higher priced items. And their perception of higher quality, higher priced items and my perception of higher quality, higher priced items are two different things. And one of the things I've learned is that my products, although they're the cheapest independent bottlings of those items, mm-hmm. they're still crazy expensive. Like some things, like our 27-year-old Jamaican, it's $200. Uh, 
it's not scalable. Yeah. And so their perception of higher priced premium quality products are things that are still scalable. Mm -hmm. So I've had to learn and adjust. I wouldn't give this retailer any credit whatsoever up into this discussion, meaning I didn't respect because while well, they produce shit, mm -hmm. right? And talking with them and taking in the information and taking in what sells and, and what's scalable and volume, I'm like, okay, I need to produce still strict standards, still high quality, still premium, but maybe slightly younger, maybe mm -hmm. slightly lower price, something yeah. that can be scalable that is still premium, but not out of the price right. range of most people, especially during a pandemic or a recession. So it, it's, I learned something and there's always gonna be, the conversations I've had with you and Matt, the conversations I've had with Carlos, like I've learned a lot and there's always more to learn. And then you end up being, you end up learning something about a subject like Matt's College at all that no one would necessarily give you credit for until, yeah. you know. So it, it's been it's been interesting. I appreciate you coming on. I didn't expect to gossip with you so much. <laughs> I know. So. I, th I, I thought this was going to go down several different pathways than, than what it did. No, uh, it, it's, it's uh, well, like I said, we're, we're friends. I've yeah. known you a long time. Uh, we, we tend to talk, and the way that we talk off camera is the yeah. way we talk on camera. Well, so, so I'm going to go ahead and set this up for the kay. next interview. Which is I don't know if it, if it, if you've ever had anybody on three times, but I've had a few on seven times. Well, I was fully expecting that because you liked that tweet I did yesterday. What was it? I was fully expecting for you to put me on the uh, hot seat about the the wine industry and. Oh no! Yeah. I did see the tweet. So but I didn't. I didn't let's save that for the next time. But All right. Yeah, I did call them out um, about their their bullshit positions. <laughs> okay, we'll save it for the next time. All right. Um, uh, Mark, uh, thank you so much for coming on. I hope you still have your yeah. job at Susto after this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too, for sure. And that you guys so. didn't lose any distribution yeah. partners. Yeah. Um, uh, we, I, we didn't call them out. We uh, didn't. But, and, and you know who you are, and we love you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mark, I love you, buddy. Uh, thanks so much right. for coming on. Thanks. I'll see you soon, buddy. Bye.